I'm Terry, um, a ranger at Andersonville National Historic Site, and we are here with one of our uh, partners at the National Museum of the Mighty Eighth Air Force. Uh, this is Heather, and she is going to talk through um, the importance of the Eighth and um, the Hundredth Bomb Group, and um, let us know everything, everything about it. Thank you for coming and having me on. So. The 8th Air Force was created here in Savannah on January 28th of 1942, downtown Savannah. Um, and then it it's chosen to move over to England to help bomb and defeat Nazi Germany. And they're gonna be located in all of their airfields will be in England to fly daylight strategic bombing missions to Nazi occupied Europe and the Royal Air Force will fly night missions. So their plan is round the clock bombing, basically. And so the eighth will be in England because of course they are the only country in Europe that is free, that has not been conquered by Nazi Germany, that is part of the allies that is um, not conquered and taken over or neutral. The eighth is comprised of different bomb groups and fighter groups that are then divided up into air divisions. And the plane behind me, the B-17 Flying Fortress, is the most used bomber plane of the eighth Air Force. And the B-17 is flown by the first and the third air divisions in the 100th Bomb Group, which is one of the bomb groups that makes up the eighth Air Force in World War II, will fly the B-17 Flying Fortress. This is, um, a G model, it is from later in the war, and that is why it is aluminum, original aluminum silver. Okay. okay? And so the crews of these bomber planes are typically 10 men. And they're all specifically trained for their jobs. The officers are all here in the nose section. The bombardier is going to sit right there in the front. So if you watch the series about the 100th Bomb Group, you see a lot of action taking place here in this nose section. It's uh, the bombardier and the navigator who sits at a table right behind and lieutenant, later captain, and then major, Harry Crosby, is shown a lot in that nose section with, his, with the bombardier on his crew, and this is where they would have been. These are the two machine guns on the side, these 250 caliber machine guns are the navigators to shoot. And then the series at certain points, you'd see um, him going back and forth, and then the bombardier here. The bombardier in this model airplane with the chin turret would have been shooting these two to protect the front of the aircraft. He would have been sitting in that small chair up there, and he had controls to control these guns because anybody who's watched the series about the 100th Bomb Group is now very aware of how completely and totally dangerous it was to be in the 8th Air Force. And so he's sitting on that chair. He has his bomb site right here in the front as a bombardier, of course, to open and close the bomb bay doors and drop bombs on the target. But if you really think about being the bombardier or the navigator or the pilots who are, of course, up in the cockpit and the only two on the crew that don't have machine guns typically, um, you have to think about, especially for lead crews in the front of the formation, you're sitting there with plexiglass nose cone that is not bulletproof between you and the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, as you know they're called, coming out of the sun and the clouds. You know they really know what they're doing. They're very well trained. They're you know basically, arguably. Um, as a matter of opinion, the best Air Force in the world in the beginning of World War II until they're, you know, shot out of the sky from the Allies. But, you know, they're coming out of the sun in the clouds in these surprise attacks at the front. They're shooting, you know, large bullets, eight millimeter cannons, that sort of thing, right there at this plexiglass nose cone that's not going to do a whole lot to stop bullets. So it was incredibly, incredibly dangerous to be in the 8th Air Force, especially in 1942, 1943, into early 1944 until the P-51 Mustang is really in regular use and rotation. And so it's com had to, I mean, just utterly petrifying. And the series does its best to show that, and it does it very well. And, you know, episode three, for example, is the one that immediately comes to mind of how completely catastrophic these missions were for the 8th Air Force and some of these 
you know, bomb groups who lose, you know, almost all, if not all of their bomber planes on these huge missions such as, you know, Schweinfurt, Regensburg on August 17th of 43, then in um, Black Week as it's known, August 8th, I'm sorry, October 8th through the 14th of 1943 when, you know, the 100th bomb group on the Munster raid on October 10th, one plane comes back and it's flown by Lieutenant Rosie Rosenthal's crew. Um, just. I can't even imagine the feeling of coming back from that mission and looking around going, where are all the other planes? Sitting in your debrief afterwards, going over everything that happened, then you get your dinner and there's nobody in there. So, and that is of course why they are sent to what was called, known as a flak house for rest and recuperation, which sometimes was even worse because a lot of the crew members that I've talked to, the veterans that I've talked to here in the almost 18 years I've worked here. It was sometimes worse not having a mission. It was easier to get up there and get going because the more you thought about it, the more stressful and the more you worried. In the very first mission, the eight flies on August 17th of 1942, there will be um, 111 men on 12 aircraft, 12 B-17s. So that's mission one, 12, 12 planes. By the end of the war, they're able to send, you know, basically 2,000 bombers on missions with, you know, fighters, fighter escorts and all of that. So, you know, each plane typically had 10 crew members on board. Sometimes it was nine on later missions. Sometimes it was just one waste gunner that manned both. Some, the bombardier is often replaced unless you're in the front. You get a toggleer who's there to shoot the guns and drop the bombs when the planes in front of them do. Um, so things change on different missions, but it's typically a 10-man crew. Each bomb group typically has four squadrons. And the series in, that shows the hundreds are the 349th, the 350th, the 351st, and the 418th. And so they often rotate three, on most missions and such, they'd rotate three squadrons on one mission, one would stand down. But on maximum effort, any plane and any crew that was available would pretty much go, um, is the standard for the most part. Um, and again, of course, things vary, but that's basically how it is. But um, and most bomb groups or fighter groups did have that. It was four squadrons, and they would kind of rotate around. Now, fighters and fighter pilots had to didn't have a standard number of missions because theirs were different. They had flight hours that they had to accumulate. So here's the waist and back of the plane. Yep, we have the top turret gunner, flight engineer, who's up behind the cockpit. He's his um, he's in the flight deck, you know, with the two pilots up in there. And he, uh, not the flight deck, but I misspoke there, but he, the two pilots are in there, the top turret gunner flight engineer. He is a tech sergeant. He monitors your engines and um, that sort of thing and then shoots to the guns. They spin around in a circle to protect the plane and the crew and the pilots. You have your radio operator right here in the little window over the wing with a lot of different radios for communication throughout the plane because you need to make sure everybody's okay, breathing okay, not shot. Everybody knows what direction they're being attacked from, so they'll speak over the intercom. You can speak to other planes, but it's typically not done because of radio interception by the enemy, in this case, Nazi Germany. You got your waist gunner here, another waist gunner on the other side, so one at each window. They're staggered so that they didn't run into each other like they did in earlier models of this plane. You got your tail gunner. <laughs> yep, yeah, they would bump into each other all the time. Um, and, you know, ours has the plexiglass window off, and it didn't have that, or um, it fogged up. They didn't like it. They weren't big fans of it. It would get cracked. It would get removed and then typically never replaced. So it was absolutely freezing to stand at the waist gunner. Then you have the tail gunner here at the back. Every one, tail gunner makes the same joke. And I can't blame them, I would too if I was them. I went through the war backwards, because they all did. And it's very bouncy and prone to air sickness back there. And it was an issue, just like the miniseries shows. Yeah. They got air sick, and most of them, because a lot of these men were like, I don't want to be on the, you know, the ground. No offense to anybody on the ground. This was all the, you know, these veterans talking. You know, I want to be up there it, with flying. I love these airplanes, and I'm going to, you know, they're just going to basically suck it up. And, you know, some of them take 
you know, Dramamine basically, an equivalent of Dramamine, that air seat sickness thing. And uh, because of course the adrenaline of being in there keeps you nice and wide awake, but um, you know, or they just had ways to deal with it. They eat um, hard candy, even though it's freezing, any food you bought would freeze solid, but it, you know, a hard candy is already frozen so, or, you know, hard, so it's okay. Um, they'd find different ways to deal with it or some of them got used to it as it went. But, you know, I've flown in one and it is very bouncy <laughs> everywhere in the plane. So in that case, the colder air blowing on you helps you feel a little bit better. But yeah, the tail gunner's back there protecting the tail. Very dangerous spot to be in as well because there's less firepower aiming backwards. German Luftwaffe Air Force knows this. Come at the tail of the plane, take the plane out as well. But the most famous that everybody always wants to know the most about is your ball turret gunner. Typically your shortest, man on board, I'd say skinniest, but they're all very thin. Um, and I'll point out on the side of the plane later, the typical crew weight that's stenciled on the side of the plane, which was very noticeable. So yeah, so here's the drawing, the image of what it was like in there. And then now, and notice his hands, cause you know, these are the triggers for him. So notice this, and now let's see the real thing because it makes it seem even <laughs> smaller when you look at me standing next to him. And I'm the kind of the typical height, I'm five foot six. And so this was a very typical height and I'm using my phone to turn on the flashlight for us. But if you look in there, you can see where the feet, the heels would go right there in that cup right there and right there. And this, they'd kind of use their left foot to help turn. This ball, this wind, round window, when they climbed in, they weren't in here for takeoff and landing in the first hour or two hours of the mission, depending. It was pretty much when they'd get to the English Channel, sometimes even over the coastline into Nazi-occupied Europe when they knew they might be attacked, that they'd get in here. So they'd be in... <laughs> Inside the fuselage, of course, they'd, the, of course, the door would be shut. They'd rotate the ball so that this door and hatch is inside the plane. That means this round window is aiming straight down. There's a machine gun, of course, here and here sticking out. So when you're getting in <laughs> and you're putting one, your left foot and then your right foot, you're looking straight down at, you know, however altitude you're at that day, straight down. So you can't be afraid of heights. You certainly can't be claustrophobic. And of course, he's going to sit here. His back is here. Head is about, you know, here. Here's, um, you know, the triggers and that. His different, you know, sights and lights and the two guns. And he's going to sit you know, basically crouched up in a ball four, six, eight, you know, 10 hours, depending. And yeah, he's basically just gonna sit, squished. This museum was founded by members of the 8th, veterans of the 8th Air Force in World War II, to honor and tell the story of their, you know, brothers in arms, their, the fellow airmen, especially to honor those who were killed in action so that they would always be remembered. And so it's important to remember that this is a story of individuals, a story of the, you know, it is the history of course of the eighth, but it is all these individual stories that make up this giant whole of eighth Air Force history. And so each and every one of them had a different experience and that's what's really the most interesting thing to me about history is to read these different stories and how they're so similar. They can be so different, but they're also so similar in many ways. Um, and so it's just important to honor our past also so we don't repeat it.